What's up? Now, Nostalgia Pod coming back at you. We're going to give you your weekly look at what's going on in pop culture. I am Pat Sheehan. This is Dave Martinson. Dave, happy 20-year anniversary, man, of me, Harry Potter. For me. Yes, for you. From the first time you read Harry Potter. British 20th anniversary. Yeah. Well, J.K. Rowling said it's Harry Potter 20, so yeah. it's Harry Potter 20. It was like a year, over a year afterwards in the States. Yeah. And then by then I had a new name. So I guess 19-year anniversary for you. <laughs> uh, so we just wanted to start off the show on a positive note because I was looking through the, the news here, and there's some not-so-optimistic stuff we're going to be talking about. We're going to be touching some stuff on uh, happened. Han Solo, which came out pretty much like right after we recorded. Oh, yeah. Uh, it was a big week. week last week. Yeah, everything happened uh, the day after we, re- we recorded, yep. which uh perfect. But yeah, we're going to be talking about Han Solo... Uh, Fargo finale, Daniel Day Lewis, and uh, Vince Staples. But let's start with Harry Potter. So, just quickly, what what's like your biggest or favorite part about Harry Potter? Like your biggest takeaway from it? What sticks uh, with you the most? Yeah, I mean, so I read the books when they came out. Read uh, read the last book, Deathly Hollows, a few months after it came out. So I was all caught up by then anyway. And I think my biggest takeaway from that, which still is true today, is that the books. Um, all connected so well yeah. and you didn't realize how big and uh intertwined the story was as you're reading the first few absolutely and as you if you ever go back you can pick up on stuff yeah no i completely agree it's kind of like uh one of those tv shows like the wire or game of thrones or mr mr robot fargo any of those where mm-hmm. you go back you watch and you're like oh i didn't notice that before oh, wow that connects to that right and you can pretty much go back and read it every time you're like oh i didn't notice that this character interacted with this character and it meant this in the long run like um i think for me you know everybody goes back to snape i feel Good. like who which his character and the way it, it just arced throughout the, mm-hmm. the series was just done brilliantly but neville like the most redemptive character sex in the game. god neville <laughs> very good looking dude now but the way he goes from being this like poor schlub to right. one of the bravest characters in the end is an awesome transition for yeah, sure definitely kills nagini right yeah, and Harry Potter also, I feel like, is the book that got a lot of our generation specifically into reading, which is pretty cool, because before that, I was reading maybe, like, Matt Christopher books. I don't know if you ever read those, like, the, like, teenage sports story books, and then, oh. well, and not even teenage, like, young y- child. Young adult, y- yeah. YA. I don't even know if young adult is, like, for, like, the 7 to 10 age range, and then Harry Potter right. came out and kind of shifted all that yeah, best so. son book series of all time translated in 73 languages are there even 73 languages there's a few hundred yeah a couple mm-hmm. hundred like yeah. 300 maybe yep so want that well why don't we move on to something a little less optimistic dave mm. so uh we'll take a look from the philosopher's stone uh, transition I don't, I don't know how i feel about that but <laughs> moving on anyway lord and miller man they're out ron howard in to direct han solo Untitled Han Solo spin-off Star Wars film. <sighs> Phil Lord and Chris Miller. It's supposed to be coming out next May. Right. But filming was supposed to end in about four weeks, three weeks? A few weeks left of shooting, plus already pre-planned weeks of reshoots, which is pretty standard. So there's yeah. still like two months left of shooting, more or less. Plus, so I... plus, you know, post-production. So what are your initial thoughts on this? Well, obviously, when you hear that a big, high-profile movie especially something like the Han Solo movie that gets so much attention and people really care about how it comes out. When any movie of that status loses its director, or in this case directors, well into shooting, it's definitely a cause for concern. Uh, you know, this harkens back to Superman 2 mm-hmm. when uh, Richard Don- uh, Donner got, you know, discredited basically. But, it and, and furthermore, these guys got picked as director you know, and Lucas specifically uh, on board with their choice right but you know as you hear more about the story and there's different takes from different uh outlets and you can definitely tell where you know what, what camp is sending which league mm-hmm. stuff like that but as you get, try and paint the whole picture it definitely seems that lucasfilm tried to make it work and then eventually they just had to you know pull the plug right it, one of the interesting one of the reports was that it seemed like Kathleen Kennedy and the rest of Lucasfilm were waiting for a sit-down meeting with Lord Miller that never came. It's like, what were they waiting for? <laughs> you know, mm-hmm. you pick these guys out, and, you know, from, from that my, my perspective on that, if you hand the keys to these guys, you got to let them drive the car. 
and you're kind of saying like take your perspective and use mm. that to drive this movie which Lord and Miller have a very specific and unique right. perspective take this way so far in it just seems like they weren't really thinking ahead to maybe we need to have more of a hand in this than we're going to actually start out with you know I think they have Lucasfilm has their you know they have their bar that they want you know they want these movies to come out a certain way and specifically for and you'll hear people criticize you know how the big studios there's no creative freedom right you know Marvel's been criticized for this in the past mm-hmm. and they, that's why you know people would leave these projects like Joss Whedon or never take them right. like Edgar Wright because they you know they don't want that much control. But in this movie, uh, this is really what I first started you know to think about is Han. This Han Solo movie, a lot of people didn't want this to exist. No, because you know Han is the most popular character in Star Wars, you know um, more or less, and he's so beloved that to do a spin off. Uh, origin story just seemed really risky and probably not worth the effort. But now you're mad that Lucasfilm was being very conservative with the, the role and the, the film, and they want to make sure it comes out a certain way. I don't see how you can play both sides of that coin. Right. And especially, you know, read more about it. Lawrence Kasdan, who wrote the script for Han Solo, and of course he wrote Empire and Jedi, so he's, you know, basically one of the most important people to Star Wars' whole existence. He was not happy that Lord and Miller were kind of improving and going off script, which should be on Lucasfilm. That's how sure. they make their movies. So yeah. they clearly were a bad fit from the start, mm-hmm. but they, they, they weren't following the script, and that's why they, they pulled the plug, among other things. And then, then you hear from the Hollywood Reporter that the crew burst out in applause once they found out Ron Howard's taking over, yeah. which is freaking crazy. Yeah. But it just seemed like the way Lord and Miller make movies, in which, of course, they've been very successful with both Jump Streets and Lego Movie. Yep. It just doesn't seem like that style, which is more like a Judd Apatow. Right. Uh, I don't think it just fits this kind of production, especially when Lucasfilm has such high expectations and standards. That's what I think. Yeah, actually, I think when they announced they're doing these spinoff movies, we had kind of said, "Do we really?" Actually, on the Nostalgia Pod, soundcloudcom Pod, they we actually talked about how we didn't know if this was such a great idea. And then Alden Ehrenreich was cast, and mm-hmm. we were like, eh, "You know, this seems like a good casting." He. He was good in... Um, Hail Caesar. Yeah, Hail Caesar. But I think, kind of going off your point, if Lucasfilm has this expectation, which they obviously deserve after creating one of the biggest franchises in the Most world. Most valuable IP in yeah, human history. Absolutely. It, they need to be more upfront with their directors. If they want, if they want to take somebody like this, mm-hmm. they need to be saying, all right, we'll give you the keys, but you need to be on board with meeting these certain expectations of being on set. Which, maybe they did, and it... Lord and Miller kind of are just so kind of by the cuff that mm-hmm. they didn't follow through with that. But in any case, it seems like there needs to be a little more leadership from the beginning hand, like on these films. Which right, it's is okay. Like it's it's a learning process. Obviously, that's a good but. point because you could think about uh, Force Awakens, which turned out uh, well in terms of the, the whole franchise. Mm-hmm. Uh, that movie was more or less rewritten. Michael Arndt, who from Little Miss Sunshine and Toy Story Three, his script was more or less thrown out. Right. Luke was the big focus of that, and JJ uh, and Lawrence Kasdan, you know, really found the movie in the writing room and then on the mm-hmm. editing, uh, cutting room floor and whatnot. And then same thing with Rogue One, where Gareth Edwards kind of stepped aside at the end for Tony Gilroy to right. kind of be like, all right, here's like our big boy knows how to make big movies. Gareth Edwards, we like you and we like what you've done, but you know, we want this guy to really finish it up for us. And then think about where we're at with Han Solo and the talk that they needed an acting coach for Alvin Ehrenreich. Once production was already started, we know he can act. Right. But I don't know how that's anyone's fault but Lord and Miller. Yeah. If you're not getting what you want from Han Solo and he's being like a, quote, Ace Ventura-like character, why wouldn't Lucasfilm jump in? Yeah. They're not going to sully, sully the brand, especially if it's this bad. And, like, I don't, I don't care if it's about creative freedom. I take this by a case-by-case basis. It's like exactly. Han Solo, they're going to be conservative. Yeah, absolutely. But it... It's worth noting that there's been no friction regarding Ryan Johnson in The Last Jedi at all. True. And I think a big part of that is because he's a more established filmmaker who's worked mm-hmm. his way up and made like eight movies before he right. took on this blockbuster. So it'll be yeah. really interesting a lot going on. to see how this comes out. And if this film flops, I, I don't know. There's going to be a lot of backlash because Han Solo is such a beloved character within this universe. And I think just overall an iconic movie character in general that if this doesn't go well, it's going to 
be pretty frustrating for fans. Yeah, and I felt this way in general before this came out, but I would not be opposed to this coming out in December instead of May. No, me neither. Let's keep the one year. Yeah. Why not? You know? I, I agree with that. I was so. actually thinking they need to push back production and let Ron Howard get his, his hands on this a little bit more. Yep. Ron Howard voiceover, they did not let him get his hands on this anymore. <laughs> <laughs> it all, if they do go back, they'll be coming out, like I think, either a week after Aquaman debuts. Oh. So that would be quite the blockbuster battle. That'd be pretty interesting. And also DC would probably not be too happy about that. Hmm. But um, Pretty yeah. interesting. Here we are. Well, uh, let me know what you think. Please yeah. add now Nostalgia Pod. Absolutely. Another um, another interesting and, and sad piece of movie news, Daniel Day-Lewis announced that he's going to be quitting acting after his next film, which is set to be released in December on Christ- Christmas Day. Phantom Thread. Yeah. Which uh, is it, isn't a confirmed name, but it's... I think that just came out, actually. Oh, really? So, yeah, okay. since, since DDL retired, I think Phantom Thread was announced okay. or whatever. Well, uh, it's a movie about fashion in the 1950s, and the rumor as of today was that he's retiring from movies to become a, a, fa- a dress fashion designer. 60-year-old man. His okay. last role will be playing the British fashion designer, Charlie James. So perhaps he uh, got inspired. I don't know. I mean, maybe he he did take a break in the '90s to become a cobbler. Which I mean, think think how crazy that is. Like you're in London, you're like, I need to get my shoes fixed. You go into this little shop, and Daniel Day Lewis like, oh yeah, I'll just cobble your shoe up for you. And you're like, oh, it's uh, it's like when Aziz Ansari went to learn how to make pasta. Yeah, <laughs> going off. Just so random. So uh, I mean, what what are your thoughts on this? It's obviously a, a sad, sad news, but right. I, in general, I've kind of always thought of him. Daniel Day Lewis is the kind of guy where. As soon as he makes a movie, he's retired until he actually makes one again. <laughs> Lincoln came out in 2012, and for years and years, there's not a peep about if he's doing anything, what he's doing. He's a very right. private man who likes to take sometimes upwards of five years in between films. Well, he's so method. Right. Like, his, uh, the, the report I read basically said it takes him like three years to really get in, feel comfortable with the character. He never stopped being Lincoln until it was done. Three years? That's insane. <laughs> Dude. And, and like, think think about how annoying that must be for, like, his family. Like, okay, uh, all right. his family. <laughs> yeah, it's like, all right, I'm just going to be Abraham Lincoln for the next three years, so uh, see you in 2016. Yeah. Like, what? That's not a way to live. I, I think there's a chance that PTA could convince him in the 2020s to come back. Yeah. Because sure. clearly they have the rapport. Right. You know, there will be blood and whatnot, but he's the only guy to win three best actors and one of only three males to have three Oscars, period. So, obviously, one of those prolific actors of all time. What is your favorite Daniel Day Lewis role? I think there's only one choice, to be honest. Yeah. There will be blood. I mean, so. he's, he's brilliant in that, but Gangs of New York is also pretty good. <sighs> Bill the Butcher. Bill the da- da- Daniel Plainview, like the, uh, I Drink Your Milkshake. Yeah, it's that's just true. Devastating role. Yeah, absolutely. Incredible. Uh, I mean, he's also pretty legendary as Hawkeye too. In uh, what last, last of the Mohicans? Mohicans? Yeah. I mean, yeah, a young, a young DDL. One of the best movies of the nineties, probably. Yeah, I don't know. So from Daniel Day Lewis to Damon Lindelof, mm, these. Uh, it's uh, been reported that he's going to be adapting a Watchmen show, uh, show for HBO. Yeah, in uh, talk still. Which feels like a good fit. He's... Lost leftovers. Let's get something just as challenging, like Watchmen. Yeah. yeah. If anyone could do it. Challenging, super weird, like dark and twisted, but with a kind of a fun edge to it. I think it'll be a good fit if it works out. It's the second attempt since 2014, though. Yeah, I never got off the ground. Which, interesting. He's going to start scra- uh, from scratch if he does yeah. go through with it. Uh, have you seen Watchmen from Zack Snyder, the yeah. 09 movie? It's a good movie. Yeah, I like it a lot. I know it's... Um, it's controversial. Like yeah, that. My take is that it's probably as good as a movie version could have been. Yeah, it's a complicated uh, text to adapt. It is. It's pretty It's pretty dense. There's a lot going on. Yeah. So I think it actually will be served well by being on TV. Yeah, I agree. Especially because there's so many characters and you can just kind of like give each character their own episode mm-hmm. throughout the season and kind of have through lines connecting them. Like, it's such an intele- intellectual, you know, work yeah. with such all these existential themes that it's just hard to really get into those effectively when you have to have move, move the plot along so briskly. Yeah. And like people always say, oh, well, the best version of Watchmen is The Incredibles, which is true to a certain extent. Like well, The Watchmen is very similar to uh, The Incredibles on like a surface level in terms mm-hmm. of like what happens with all the heroes and stuff. Right. But I think this actually could be really exciting for HBO in a post-Game of Thrones world. In honor of our 69th episode, do you want more blue penis in your life? Oh, dude. 
the blue most schlong. Penis. Big, big ones. <laughs> and, well, that was the thing. They didn't even give Dr. Manhattan really, like, that impressive a penis. Like, come on, you're a god. Like, I'm sure he could have. <laughs> Moving on to uh, some eight, eight more HBO shows, Silicon Valley and Veep wrapped up. Uh, I know you don't watch Veep, just quick, it was another really well-written season um, under a new showrunner, but just as good, Livy Louis-Dreyfus is just... Livy? Olivia Louis-Dreyfus. Julia? Julia Louis-Dreyfus. I always fucking hit that. Like, Jesus Christ. <laughs> Julia Louis-Dreyfus. Um, <laughs> always brilliant, and the, the cast is just undeniable. Timothy Simons, for some reason, just... Always like hits me in the funny. How is Buster Bluth? <laughs> Gary, he's fucking awesome on this show. Good. I mean, it's 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 excellent. Silicon Valley, though, mm. did you get to finish up the season? I did. What were your thoughts on this season? It was good. I mean, it, knowing that T.J. Miller's Ehrlich Bachman is leaving, kind of started weighing on me at the end. Mm-hmm. And also, the last few episodes, Richard was such an asshole. Such so, an asshole. like he's so unlikable right now. Right. And I guess at the end it it's was annoying. somewhat redemptive, and it seems like the heart of the show right now is the relationship between Richard and Jared, which is kind of a weird choice. Yeah. It's like the angel and the devil in a way at, at the moment. Um, it's a decent idea to keep going. Yeah, I, I think, you know, T.J. Miller leaving is probably somewhat necessary. Did you read the his exit interview, basically? It felt so like a breakup. It felt like a breakup, said he didn't like one of the showrunners, Mike Judge, uh, no, Alec Berg. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't know. It's kind of a weird interview, and also it seemed like they wanted to give him a reduced role, and he was like, "Nah, I'm he, out." He's well, his character I think is actually what his character does in Silicon Valley is kind of important because he's like the big, uh, like shock value and big mm-hmm. like loud humor. Right. And without him there, there's no one to fill that void. Yeah. You know, like I think Gene Yang's probably on his way out as well. Same thing with Big Heads, but like either way, those guys are not. Don't bring the show what Ehrlich does, so I'm really right. curious to see where they go from here and perhaps, you know, figuring out how Richard relates with his uh, his boys. I'm wondering if that's sense. why Gavin Belsom came back. Mm-hmm. If T.J. Miller's absence, they decided to bring back Gavin Belsom and hope that he can kind of fill that role. Mm-hmm. Uh, how, what did you think of how they wrote him off? Basically just got high really? off opium and then they left him to bed. Gavin left, left him? Yeah. Yeah, it was abrupt. Yeah, it's kind of strange. Yeah. Uh, don't know. Yeah, it was very weird. Uh, definitely a sad ending to the season, knowing T.J. Miller won't be back. But uh, something we're really excited about: Game of Thrones. Man, oh, yeah. drop that second trailer. Have you ever heard of this show? <laughs> what is that? You, you should catch up. A on Song it. of Ice and Fire. And if you aren't caught up on Game of Thrones, if you want to try to binge it and then listen to a podcast to really help you understand it, because binging is not the way that we recommend watching Game of Thrones. Correct. Binge Mode, very good podcast yes. from The Ringer. Uh, it takes about really half as long as watching all the show would be, so rather than rewatching, just listen to the pod. And you, and you understand it's so, much better. so much more about yep. it. It's very helpful. Uh, what did you think of the second trailer? Anything that really stood out to you, excited you? Well, similar to Binge Mode, uh, Mallory Rubin and Jason Tepsione did a trailer breakdown on The Ringer's YouTube channel, mm-hmm. about 12 minutes long, and they go frame by frame. And if you watch that, uh, anything you didn't pick up on, you'll have picked up on. And there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of interesting threads for sure. Interesting. Um, we'll talk more about what we think is going to happen in Game of Thrones season seven in two, two weeks. weeks. Check that out. Soundcloud.com slash nostalgia pod and YouTube. Boom. But yeah, in general, I'm very excited. The trailer showed me a lot of cool stuff. Yeah. Definitely down. Barrick with that fiery with sword. The flame sword. Yes. Very exciting image. Yes. Jamie in battle. Very int- I mean, kind of expected, I guess, because Targaryens, yeah, the Targaryens yeah. are on their way. Um, the, I think the only other thing that seemed really interesting to me was it seems like John's going to be all alone, like out there fighting in the trying to like connect people. But There's also, there's going to be some suicide mission going on beyond the wall. Yeah, by the look of it. And so he might be the only one to make it out. Well, we'll see if he makes it. We'll out. get into that. Sansa's soon. Sansa's the closing line. The lone wolf dies, but the pack survives. Mm. That's not a Sansa. I can't do a Sansa impersonation. <laughs> so, um, and, and you know, I'm listening to too much binge mode when I'm trying to do yeah. a lot of, like, Jason Sepsio just, like, in my head with these. Titles, titles, <laughs> titles. <laughs> <laughs> I think his best one is uh, Joffrey. Good. <laughs> his, his, his Varys, I, I almost had to stop listening to the podcast. It was so annoying. Actually, I think the funniest thing of all was when he, he did George R. R. Martin read the sex scene. <laughs> yeah. Don't want to spoil it, but man, is that hilarious. Moving on to 
another very good show wrapped up. I did not get to finish it, so Dave, I'm oh damn, I'm gonna let I'm gonna let you dump slacking. I'm throwing the alley oop up to you. Mm. I'll slam it home. Fargo. Yes. I think I'm only uh, I think I only finished episode seven, so I have three more to go. Oh, eight's really good. Yeah, but that's why I hear, which is why I'm I didn't want to like rush through it today. Mm-hmm. So, what did you think of Fargo season three? Well, it's not as uh, good as the first two, <gasps> but it's still really good. And I'm happy right. it exists. You know. So like, it, I, like th- there's a lot of uh, tiredness, I guess, is a sentiment that has been thrown around regarding season three. Um, definitely not as buzzworthy in critical circles, uh, but still talked about a lot just right. because of, you know, it's Noah Hawley, it's this great cast. Um, I think overall, you know, without really spoiling it or getting too deep anyway, because I know probably a lot of people haven't caught up anyway, is that the characters weren't as resonant this time around, despite great actors playing them, that without that character connection as a viewer, mm-hmm. it's tough to feel invested in a story that has a few beats you recognize from right. previous seasons as well as the movie. Yeah, I think basically from where I've gotten to so far, Mary Elizabeth Winstead and David Thewlis seem to be the, the standouts from this season. Absolutely. Um, you know, it's what, Varga and I forgot what her name uh, is. Nikki so. Swango. Nikki Swango, right. Um, but yeah, overall the season was a little underwhelming, at least to the point that I'm at. I, hear, mm-hmm. I do hear episode eight is very good, so maybe that yeah. will shift my opinion a bit. But... Uh, Fargo is not supposed to be back in another three years, supposedly. I mean, we'll see. If it's back at all. Yeah. Like, and it, I think actually was really telling was when Noel Hawley was talking and saying this much that he might he doesn't know if he'll come back, which means they might not do it again. FX might let it go. Um, he talked about the need that, yeah, if I want to do it again, I have to get this small-town cop that represents, you know, all of good. And I need this Why corrupter of evil, and I need it to be based around some... I a crime what... in the Midwestern United States. I'm like, wait a minute. Why, why do you feel hamstrung by this formula? Yeah. Like, Fargo I'm... as an anthology series, we already have this baseline. You should feel free to do whatever you want, not have to keep commenting on society right. and trying to, you know, have something grand to say. I've, I, I, it is annoying that he, that's the way he feels when I mean, it doesn't need to be that way. And I think people would be very open to him changing right. it up. Well, and to further your point, I think the reason Mary Elizabeth Winstead was such a standout character this season because she was so different yep. from the other couple seasons Correct. so cool. uh hopefully if if it does come back it'll take a slightly different yeah. turn but absolutely still worth watching years. oh yeah definitely right. it's it's like uh the bar was very high yeah it's like still a gourmet dish it's just yeah. not like the it's not the, the best song on the record whatever however you want to yeah, put it sure but talking about a good record vin staples big fish theory Hell second yeah. album from vin staples uh of the of uh any given wednesday claim <laughs> He was, a re- he was a recurring guest on that show. They had 10 episodes. He's a and he was on funny twice. guy. Very dry. We talked about this. Very dry humor. Yeah. Gallows um, humor. Yeah. And it's kind of dark. And that kind of came across on this album. I, I don't know. There was some t- like there was some talk of suicide. and Well. Like, the, what is that song? Alyssa's inter- Interlude. Right. It had Amy song. Winehouse. Like, uh, yeah. Yeah. Interview where we talked about self-destruction. Kind of dark, but this record killed it, man. It's really good. Um. First note we have to make, of course, we make this note all the time. A tight 36 minutes. Yes. <laughs> Which is uh, two thumbs up from yeah. Nostalgia. It was awesome. Um, but the fact that it was short actually kind of plays into the way uh, Vince comes across on this record, where he had it, it moves at such a rapid, brisk pace, yep. both in terms of the runtime and the way the production and just uh, the, flows. Even the way he sings on, or right. raps on it. And it fits the way he, the lyrical uh, content, where he doesn't mm-hmm. feel like he has any time to waste. Right about everything he's commenting mm-hmm. on, and it's so funny because when he talked to Vince Staples, and he's like, "Yeah, I mean, he's like, how do you, how do you feel about you know the overwhelming uh, sentiment of white people appreciating black art?" He's like, "Hey, my job's to make songs. Right, I'm not commenting on that." But then you listen to his music, and he's commenting on all of it, all of it, and he just lets his music speak, and then you know, will crack his jokes and stuff. Just yep. the way he. he his perspective on life he's such a fascinating guy and this i think this is really a triumph of like what hip-hop still can be like we keep talking about the diversity of uh rap these days mm-hmm. and all the different sounds and voices there are and again vince staples i've talked about how logic doesn't have a, a clear sound vince staples has a freaking really unique sound yeah and with this album with the production the the uh, electronic uh influence mm-hmm. which is very far away from uh, the gangster rap up- upcoming he's had. Oh, yeah. Uh, he's well on his way to 
being like a, a multi uh, stylist, like a Drake, a Kanye, or right. a Gambino. Mm-hmm. And not a lot of people can say that right now. No, that's that's the really interesting thing about listening to this. Uh, you know, when I actually, the first time I listened to it, I put it on at work, and I sort of had it as background music, knowing I was going to go back and listen a little more mm-hmm. deftly. But it actually pulled me away from the uh, the work I was doing. I actually kind of stopped and started listening more intently because of the sound. I mean, with with rap especially, sometimes I just tune out and listen more to the beat. Mm-hmm. The beats drew me in, but his lyrics were so on point, so creative and meaningful. It really kind of uh, woke me up a bit to, to him as an artist. And mm-hmm. I mean, as someone that I've known of, I like some of his songs, but I'm not totally in, like into him as an artist. I'm definitely gonna be checking out him more and like staying tuned into him because, like mm-hmm. you said, I think he does have potential to be a Gambino, Kanye like artist in the future moving forward, right. especially with an album this strong as your second album. I know it's really, really strong, and like you can't overstate it. The fact that there's he's got like, Flume making beats and Sophie and GTA. He's got like, he had Bonnie Vare, yeah, uh, which, producing one of these songs, the very first one. And like, again, th- the fact that this production is so far away from the where he started, right. where his lyrical content has continued to get stronger and stronger, mm-hmm. I don't see how you can expect him to be someone who continues to make very diverse music, yeah, while I, also having some substance to it as well. He like tweeted calling this record uh, Afrofuturism, <laughs> which I mean. If you want to pick apart what that really means, you could probably... I'm sure he'd do it with you. Sure, absolutely. <laughs> but if you if you had to think about it, you're basically talking about creating this new form of hip-hop. And that's kind of what he is moving to, in a sense. I mean, there have obviously been other artists that have touched on a similar style, but this seems to be very unique mm-hmm. and something that's very exciting because, like you said, you get someone like Flume, who's a very, uh, one of the most up-and-coming um, electro artists right now. And you get someone like Damon Albarn, who uh, was singing on this and he had him on his album for gorillas Mm -hmm. and he's pulling from all these different influences that just want to be making something new something unique and he brings such a a specific but uh mature perspective to this for someone who's 22 yeah i think so i think he's in 1993 yeah like it's amazing to see the work he's doing and really exciting as well what what song do you feel like if you had to tell somebody like Listen to this, and you'll get hooked on the album. What would you point them to? Big Fish. Yeah, Big Fish. Is... Juicy J. I was up late night balling. <laughs> yeah, that that song video a banger, dude. So good. Fantastic banger. Yeah, right. I think it's the other song with with Kendrick. I mean, Kung Fu Kenny now. Yeah, which he actually. That's a really good verse. Yeah, he kills it on this, and you know we I've been giving Kendrick a little bit of shit on our past pods for just doing anything like featured on any song basically mm-hmm. he kills it on this right like the, and like talking about the state of rap and that song is, is awesome um any That's, other songs that stood out to you i like 745 as well uh, again it's only 12 songs which yeah. a few of those are interludes 36 minutes yeah um but yeah overall really succinct succinct listen and it's definitely something you can't skip no um, definitely also not. i want to correct myself last week i said he was a compton rapper where he's really, he really, he reps Long Beach, gotcha. which is like 20 miles from Compton. So I wasn't that far off. Still West Coast, still SoCal. Right. But I just want to clarify that Long Beach is, sure. is uh, just like a Snoop Dogg. We're always keeping it real here on Nostalgia Pod. Any last thoughts on this album? Listen to it. Yeah, just check it out. And give us your thoughts. Uh, tweet us at Nostalgia Pod. There'll be some songs on our Spotify playlist, which we always update every week. Definitely. So check that out. We'll be talking next week about our... 2017 best ofs thus far our power rankings if you will yeah. so we talk about music then as well as a bunch of other stuff yeah we did uh power rankings last year we're gonna do awards this year yes. so uh tweet us your thoughts on uh your favorite stuff of the year so far we're gonna be giving you some very specific thoughts and the following week's gonna be game of thrones so if you want to stay up to date with any news uh for pop culture and get our takes on that Follow us at Nostalgia Pod. Right. We'll be tweeting out our, our takes. Also follow Dave at Martin Swagger and myself yeah. at Shiny World Peace. Spider Man Homecoming, Baby Driver. Yeah. War for the Planet of the Apes. Dunkirk. Dunkirk. A lot of good stuff coming. Yeah. And then Game of Thrones. So. Yep. Also, we really should catch up on Twin Peaks because. I'm uh, making a point of finishing Twin Peaks this year because everyone says it's absolutely superb. Yeah. And. and and I don't want to miss this conversation <laughs> that seems to be happening every week. So. I know, but it's it's already like behind. Like, there's what twelve episodes in this this season. I think it's only eight. Only eight. Yeah, it finishes at the end of August, so there's a lot okay. of time still. Gotcha. So, anyways, uh, that's that's our show for this week. We love you. We'll see you next week.